10 years ago, if you tried putting that proposition on the table, a lot of businesses would say, oh, really? It's an interesting idea, question mark. And then they might throw it to the edge of their business. And five years ago, they might say, yes, we've got something going on on the edge of the business on that. You might be interested to see it. But today, people understand that it's actually central to the business. And they can almost see, yes, we're being asked to do this, but they can't see how. So what we were writing about is how. How in practice do you go about delivering social value? And that is a new imperative for leadership today. I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. Welcome to FCLT Global's Going Long podcast. Our guest today is Lucy Parker. Lucy is a strategic advisor at the Brunswick Group and co-author of The Activist Leader, A New Mindset for Doing Business. With her co-author, John Miller, she leads Brunswick's efforts in helping companies get to grips with their role in society. She has more than 20 years' experience with global corporates across a range of sectors, from pharmaceuticals to engineering, from retail to telecoms. So welcome, Lucy. Thanks for being here. Great pleasure to be with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what inspired you to write this book, The Activist Leader? I know you wrote a book called Everybody's Business about 10 years ago. How have things changed? What led to, led to this project? You're right. There's a 10-year journey behind the book. Um, and I think that John and myself, who've been leading the work in the, in the firm over the 10 years, feel that we've seen a lot of businesses struggle with this question. And the proposition really at the heart of our work is if you want to be a leading business today, you have to deliver financial value and social value hand in hand, not one at the expense of the other, together. And that is a new demand on leadership. It has a lot to do with a long-term time frame, which is why I'm so delighted to be talking to you today. Um, in the immediate term, people find this a struggle, but when you think about it in the long term, it's an absolute imperative. And of course, most of the people who lead businesses today have been, if you like, brought up in business through a paradigm that says financial value is the critical and sole priority. And indeed, that's probably what got them their roles today. They're extremely good at that. They're well-versed, they're highly experienced, but this thing about social value, that's more problematical, it's different, it's a new picture for them. And so I think that there are a lot of business leaders today asking themselves the question, how do I do that? Now, 10 years ago, when John and I wrote Everybody's Business, if you tried putting that proposition on the table, a lot of businesses would say, oh, really? It's an interesting idea, question mark. And then they might throw it to the edge of their business. And five years ago, they might say, yes, we've got something going on on the edge of the business on that. You might be interested to see it. But today, people understand that it's actually central to the business. And they can almost see, yes, we're being asked to do this, but they can't see how. So what we were writing about is how. How in practice do you go about delivering social value? And that is a new imperative for leadership today. It is a new imperative, and people really are struggling with this because, as you said, they've been brought up to deliver um, one set of, of metrics that are relatively narrow, still difficult, very difficult, but, but now much broader. And you've, you've called this the activist leader. So you're not just saying, you know, do a little bit of this. You're saying lean into this. Tell us about that word activist. Yes, and, and for most business leaders today, Activist doesn't sound like a friendly word at all. Um, shareholder activism has, has taken a very big piece of a lot of minds in boardrooms today. But of course, actually, shareholder activism is only borrowing the mantle from NGO activism and social activism from a long time ago. So a lot of business leaders are really uh, used to the idea that activism is coming at them. It's attacking them. It's unreasonable. It's unfriendly. And you've got to defend yourself from it. But if you step back a moment and go, what is activism, really? I think we're saying that activism is a way you approach a problem. And most activist leaders through all time, in all places, on all subjects, have actually looked at a really challenging problem, possibly an intractable problem, very starkly. They see the 
nature of the problem very clearly in front of them and they go, and I think that might have something to do with me. I think maybe I've got something to do with that and I could help, I could be part of it. Not the whole answer, but I could be part of it. And crucially, they step towards it and they mobilize others. And that's the activist spirit. And if you look at how to tackle this today and what's needed today, it's business leaders who go, I see the problem. I think it's something to do with me. I'm going to step towards it and mobilize others to help it happen. So we're saying that spirit needs to be in business leaders today. And we didn't dream it up. The reason we wrote the book is that we're seeing a lot of it. And so the people who aren't seeing it or aren't familiar with it are asking, how is it possible? But the reason we packed the book with examples is to say, we're not imagining this. We're seeing a lot of really highly respected, hugely experienced, very successful leaders doing it. So let's map out what it takes. Right. Um, and many leaders, the ones you quote in your book or, or profile in the book, are people who have leaned into this. Yes. Um, still a lot of people that I meet are in this trade-off mentality. They yes. think shareholder return or stakeholder. You do something social or focus on my business. So tell us a little bit how you break through that trade-off mindset. You've mentioned the time frame, which of course is close to our hearts. Yes. Um, but but it's, there's a real tension. You know, you're trying it, to run a business and your employees are um, rabble-rousing about some issue that maybe you don't feel comfortable with. How do, how do you get out of that uh, trade-off mindset? Well, I think it is it, it is the activist mindset is how you get out of it. So I, I agree. And, and nobody is pretending this is easy. This isn't, oh, well, now you've seen it, just get on with it. And there are immediate priorities and immediate returns to deliver and all of that. So I, I don't think anybody's pretending this is easy. But I do think that a lot of the challenges in the world, and we are very much saying, can you see the challenges in the world, whether those are climate change or biodiversity or waste or inequality or inclusion. You could name all the questions that come into this area, couldn't you? These are to do with your business, if you're a big business today. The kinds of business we're talking about, these are systemically important businesses. They're built into the way the system works. And if the world is trying to respond to these issues, they're bringing them to your door. So these societal questions have become business questions. They're either showing up because investors are starting to ask the question and or because regulators are starting to ask the question or pushing those agendas and will answer it for you if the business doesn't and or employees care. So more and more stakeholders around the business are saying, as you look into the future of the business, this is how we're expecting you to run it. So it may not be in the next year, but this is coming and these are going to hit your business. And furthermore, those are now starting to show up. They're starting to show up in crops that don't grow in the same place they used to. They're showing up in regulation that's asking you to commit to net zero. They're also showing up in opportunity. So I think what you're starting to see, you would well know, that the investment community is starting to go, are you actually capitalizing on the opportunity this could bring? The disruption this is going to wreak, the demand for innovation and for new models, new business models, are you on that or are you letting somebody else take that from you? So it used to be risk mitigation alone, but now it's risk mitigation and opportunity. So in your book, you go through nine sort of steps about how people um, approach this problem and, and tackle it and, and ways of pulling it apart. One of the ones that really caught my eye was um, making it a, the core of a company strategy. Because we do see oftentimes that a company has a business strategy and then they have a nice sustainability report with you know pictures of trees and things like that. But that never really works. So talk about some of the people who've done this well. You quote Walmart and a few others. How, yes. how do you do this well? Well, one of the things that's extremely striking is that this idea about the core is actually to do with how you run the business every day. It sounds so obvious when you say it. You could sort of I can't believe you're saying such an obvious thing. And we, one of the people we, um, I interviewed when we were talking about the book was, was interestingly, Coca-Cola on plastics. Well, Coca-Cola, of course, is uh, a self-acknowledged biggest plastic polluter in the world. So 
regulation is going to come down the pipe, quite apart from what you think your consumers and customers are doing, and, and the brand damage of your name showing up all over the world on beaches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The business felt it had to grip it. So we were talking to the CEO there and saying, you know, how, how, how are you approaching this? He just, well, I have strategies and operational imperatives inside the business, and I expect them to report to me with targets regularly. We've got to expect this for these areas too. It sounds so plain, so simple. So we asked about three times. No, all I'm saying is get them to report to you. Where are the targets? What is your progress? Where are you going to deliver innovation if you can't meet the targets today and expect it to report to you in the way you expect everything else to report to you? That is almost rule number one. And yet most businesses don't do it. In other words, run the social side or the social deliverable, if you will, just like a business deliverable. 100%. No different. Right. And then you can start getting into innovation. And of course, one of the things which often captures people's attention, especially if you've never heard it before, is, is Nike and what they call SBNI. So, you know, they really decided to put their necks on the line about this question. So they were telling great stories about how sustainable their products were. And of course, they are famous. Their brand is almost synonymous with innovation within their sector. And they suddenly thought, you know, we are innovating in our products. And then at the very end of the process, we go, well, let's count how much sustainability damage that's done. They made a huge breakthrough when they put sustainability expertise into the innovation department. Sounds so obvious. But they created a unit that was innovation and sustainability connected, completely transformed how they approached their product creation. That was a first mover in a way, but you now start to see that all over the place. You put the sustainability paradigm into the innovation, all kinds of different things happen. And I think that one of the ways of looking at that is just to say, can you just ask yourself the question, what would happen if we looked at it through that lens? So Philips is obviously another story. It's to sell light bulbs. Well, we know about the built-in obsolescence of light bulbs and we know the problem of energy use and we know the problem of the waste of the energy. They actually invented a whole new business line which was to do with selling lighting as a service. Suppose we took responsibility for the light bulbs and the lighting systems and people just buy the service from us and we manage the whole process and equipment and delivery much more effectively. Better for them commercially, whole new line of business, talking about the opportunity, and meanwhile, massive improvement on the environmental story. So being prepared to think of the question another way around is part of how you run it into the core. And better for their customers, because their customers don't actually want light bulbs, they want light. They want light, right. and that's how they thought about it. Yes. They literally said, we have to think, what are we actually giving them? We're giving them light. So can we run the thing differently? Mm -hmm. And over and over again, especially as we were researching for the book and, and we're looking up all the stories one could find, over and over again, you went, you know, this is somebody who just said, suppose we had to do it differently, where would we start? And just by asking that question, the core changes. So one is just run it, as you said, exactly as you would run any other deliverable. And the other is, are you prepared to innovate the business model? Are you prepared to go, if we were looking for this outcome in the end, would we operate it differently? And would we even think of a different business model? And you point out in the book, of course, that um, during COVID, people really rethought their business models, you know, necessity, the mother of invention and so on, because they had to. Uh, but can we sort of, um, rather than having a, a pandemic, just think about it sort of through those same lenses? Yeah. Well, it, interestingly, I know that uh, Bernard Looney, who of course heads up BP, his uh, takeout from COVID was, didn't we just learn we can do all kinds of things when we have to? shouldn't we have that in our minds when we ask ourselves these questions? So if you look at the kind of, let's take the environmental ones because they're so much in front of our eyes today. You know, if you look at the imperative and the urgency of the climate storyline, or you look at the scale of the biodiversity collapse that we're looking at, this is about an urgent requirement to do something differently. Now, most people, when they look at these problems, almost feel disoriented by how helpless they are. What, what, is, what are most of us to do about biodiversity collapse? If you have a really significant leadership role in one of these big businesses, you have levers to pull. You are not helpless. You can do things about it. So what you're seeing is business leaders starting to go, 
oh, wait a minute, I do have to rethink things. I'm part of that big storyline. And for good or ill, my business is part of that system that needs changing. So what am I going to do about it? Now, if I were to look at the businesses that are not activist leaders, they will say, mm, I know it's really, really, it's really difficult. And when the regulators have sorted it, absolutely we'll do it. Or, you know, well, it needs a lot of innovation. So I think, um, you know, when people have created the new technologies, we'll do something about it. And there's always this wait and see, others will act. And this is as far as we can go within today's business model. The activist leader is looking at the actual problem in the world and going, if that's what we're trying to fix for, what have we not thought up yet that we've got to think up? That's the activist mindset. It's not waiting for other people to run the imperative. Now, that doesn't mean you can necessarily step out in front of your entire industry and take a load onto your own costs to do something. But what else could you mobilise? Are you advocating for the enabling policy? Have you put another channel into your innovation that takes care of the sustainability thing? Have you asked your customers about a different business model? Are you busy on it? Are you actually trying to do something through your business that responds to that big question in the world? That's the activist leader. And I, and I think the one thing you've said here and also in the book is that, that these leaders have made the, the leap from this is my business, I'm managing it well within, within the four walls of my business, yes. to, well, maybe my business is bigger than some governments or maybe my business, you know, because I've got suppliers and customers or mm -hmm. I touch the whole system or I need the whole system to change, uh, have, have really kind of picked their heads up beyond that. How, how, what... What makes people make, make that recognition that they can't just do it themselves? It's not just, you know, it's just not getting their own house in order. Yes. And that, they, that they've got a responsibility or an opportunity Both. to reach beyond. Yeah. Both. And you're so right. I mean, we do map out nine steps, as you say. But if you had to pick one, which marks out today's leaders, it's the leaders who are driving for system-wide change. That's when you see that, you absolutely know you're seeing somebody in this new model, and there's lots of it about. So, um, you know, there's a very interesting story, which we do tell in the book of, of Tesco some years ago, jumping onto the issue of food waste. So to partly answer your question, at the beginning, they were thinking to themselves, well, actually, our food waste record is very good, isn't it? I mean, have you seen our stores? We're pretty strong in the industry. You could almost say a leader in the industry in managing food waste in our stores. This is simultaneous to the world's analysis of the food waste problem being 30% of the food that is grown is wasted. Well, that's catastrophic when you think about it in the long term. And interestingly, if Tesco is one of the biggest players in the global food system, and you could name other such businesses, they're in that system. And the reason that their food waste record inside their stores is so good is it's being pushed up or down the value chain, isn't it? So once the leadership starts to go, what, what are we to that bigger question? Then actually there's all kinds of action you can take. What are you doing through your value chain to manage waste differently? What are you doing about the way you package goods to make it last longer? By the way, what are you doing with your customers and selling them two for one on perishable goods? Is that the way you needed to go when you were driving up your marketing? So suddenly you're operating across the entire value chain. And something you said a moment ago is hugely important, which is you're starting to think, I need, this, I need the system to help me. So today you're seeing all kinds of questions where companies are making commitments, whether it's to net zero or plastic waste reduction or something. They can't do it alone. They can't meet their own targets alone. So they need the system. And a way of looking at the system in a way is the ecosystem where who do you need around the table to sort the plastic waste problem if you're Coca-Cola? If you're actually trying to deliver sustainable aviation fuels, who needs to be at that table to work it out? And the answer is the ecosystem. And that's where all the lead players are. They're working out where do... Where does my business intersect with somebody else's role in this ecosystem? And how do we collaborate to break the pattern of how it's historically been done? And there's a, there's a marvelous story that captures, I think captures it beautifully with Maersk who uh, commissioned 
some ships to run on, let's shorthand it, green fuel. And for a long time, there's been a trade-off in the industry, as you know. So there aren't enough ships that will run on green fuel because there's not enough production of green fuel. Meanwhile, there's not enough production of green fuel because there's not enough ships to run on green fuel. So everybody in the system can look at each other and they sort of slightly draw up the barriers between themselves and they go, well, when you do it, I'll do it. And so it carries on for a decade against this kind of urgency on the question. And Maersk said, very interestingly, the ships we commission today are going to be on the ocean in 2050. And if those are fossil fuel assets that we're putting in the world today, how can anybody in this industry possibly meet net zero targets for 2050? So they commissioned ships that would run on green fuel. I think there were eight of them in the first place, and then they moved it to 13 to, to be delivered within, say, a couple of years. Meanwhile, they invested in scaling up green fuel. Meanwhile, they worked with their customers to underpin the production of green fuel, saying that they would take it when, the, when it was in the market. So they were collaborating right across the system to break the deadlock that nobody's going to do anything. Well, that's an activist mindset, and it's a system-wide drive for change. And there's example after example like that, and that's where the leaders are. And what I find so interesting about your examples, including that one, is um, they're not waiting for a regulator or a government to do it for them. They're saying, okay, we need this, and we need this, and we need this for our business to be successful, so let's go make that happen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what I mean by you're pressed up against the actual imperative in the outside world, the actual issue in the world that is challenging you. And you, you mentioned Walmart earlier. I mean, if you were to look at biodiversity and Walmart, I mean, some of the work they've been doing there is quite extraordinary. And that's another version of system-wide change, because if you're Walmart, of course, you can ripple out through the entire food system. So you make commitments on biodiversity, but you can't deliver those commitments without your value chain doing it. So then they drive that through the value chain, which is another version of system-wide change. Um, so th there are different ways in which you have a footprint across the system, in which you can influence the system. You may be a business that's grown up as, an, as the innovator to break the system. You may be one of the huge incumbents where you touch virtually every player in the system and the way you demand practice from your supply chain becomes normalized practice. Or you might be an incumbent that's prepared to create a new business model or a new product. And uh, I think that um, there's a very interesting thing about being a beacon in this new model. So you take um, Apple, and we all know how much everybody loves the Apple products because they're, you can practically stroke them, the aluminium, on the, the shininess of the laptops. And they made commitments on resource, re resource use. In fact, they were absolutely out there in commitments on the circular economy. We're going to make more and take less. And they discovered that you couldn't recycle that kind of aluminium that far. So as they said, our answer was to make a new kind of aluminium. And that's recyclable and recyclable and recyclable and meets the standards for their consumers. But actually, when they do that, they're laying down a challenge that goes way beyond that version of aluminium for their products, a bit like Maersk. They're going, it can be done. Don't tell me it can't be done. Just ask yourself the question, what if we had to do? And then act. That's an activist mindset. So these examples you're giving are um, quite related to somebody's business. Sustainable fuel, um, aluminum, uh, whatever it might be. Sometimes businesses have gotten themselves in this, um, across this line of things that are, are less directly relevant to their business. Maybe it is um, Black Lives Matter, or maybe it is rights for certain people in different, in various countries that have more traditionally been the purview of governments or social leaders. How, how does a leader know what's in their business hmm. and what's not in their business? <laughs> and how do they, how do they, because we've seen missteps on, on this, as well as people who've done it well. How, how do you draw the line? It's not an easy line to draw, is it? No. Um, so one of the things we're often asked is, where should I focus? Right? So 
a common feeling, and my goodness, you can relate to it, that we hear a lot in the, in the people we work with, is it just seems to keep coming. There's another issue I'm supposed to look after, and then you can name them all. And then next comes, and do I have to do them all? Is that what I have to do? Um, and of course, the answer is you, you can't. You can't do them all, which is why our very first step is focus. <laughs> focus on the things that actually are the most significant that intersect with your business the most closely and where you could make the biggest impact. So it's a two-way street. It's where, where, where is it impacting you? Do you intersect with it? And where can you make the biggest difference to it? And then you start to narrow it down. Now, it, it's true that in the territory of responsible business, these days people have to have a pretty respectable operation across all of it. But if you really want to stand out as a leader in this space, you're picking the few things and going for them. And in the societal space, we've talked a lot about the environmental space, in the societal space, it's unsurprising that some of the companies that move in that space are either companies that are very closely related to prosperity, which is why you see banks and other such financial services uh, organisations often talking about uplift in, in, in communities and so forth. Um, so we talked about J.P. Morgan Chase in the book. And interestingly, they've got a very interesting approach to it, which is we've decided that we are there for the prosperity of the nations we work in and the communities we work in. So we're going to work very closely with the communities in which we operate. Out of that came their cities program, which is really a globally leading program. And they work deeply in some communities, but the model is replicable and the model is shareable. So it may be a social arena, but not unlike that example of aluminium in Apple. They're going, this is how you could go about it if you were going to do it. So, of course, they've been working in inner cities in America. So Black Lives Matter comes along. Well, that's not such an extraordinary stretch, because if you have really for 10 years been working with partners in inner cities in America, you are going to have encountered some of the stresses and strains that drove Black Lives Matter. So actually, if you stay closely into those arenas, you can build on them. And a lot of the societal questions that are pulling people out of shape are really different faces of the inequality issue. And once you've understood that, and once you're earnest about the inequality issue, you can start talking from the base of what do you care about as a business? What action have you taken? And therefore, what have you got to say? So our advice would be, if you're being pulled from pillar to post by political debate, that political debate is not your debate. That's politicians arguing about the debate. Have you got something to say on that question? Have you been standing up for gender rights or ethnicity rights? And so it goes on. And if so, you can explain why you've been standing up for those rights in your business and why you think it's important. But you don't have to get pulled out of shape by the political debate. And that actually stands you in very good stead over and over again. Can you say, this question intersects with our business? That's why we've been working on it for a long time, which is why you would expect us to have a view. And you speak about what you've been doing and what your view of the question is. But you don't have to get pulled off balance into everybody else's conversation. And if you're a business that hasn't done that, so you, you, the, the businesses you profile in this book are, as you said, beacons, leaders in their um, fields. What if you're um, just coming to this conversation, you're, you know, a little, a little behind, maybe not as global, not as big a company, and something like that comes up. Is it do the work before you say anything? Is it say something and then do the work? How do, how do, you, how do you get started? Question. What, a great, what a great question. So uh, there's two questions in there, I think. But let's take the f first level of question you ask. Something comes up, as ooh, it hits us in the face. We haven't been in this area before, and the world is lit up by this question. The basic thing is don't separate what you say from what you do. And if you haven't met it before, then you'd better have a pretty clear response as to what you're going to do if you're going to speak up. It's almost fine to have not done it, as long as you're clear that you are going to act on it now. What is really dangerous is just to speak. And you watch the businesses that get in trouble, they've just spoken. 
So you always want to go back to, is there an intersection between this question and our business? Have we acted on it? And if not, are we prepared to act on it now? Then you can speak. And when I said I think there's two levels of what you're, we're asking there, I think that the, the examples we profile are, are long-term leading examples. But it's really encouraging to know that almost always they've started with one move that's relatively manageable. They get started. You see the, you have the attitude, you see the issue, you see the first move, and you build from there. You don't have to come out fully baked. You have to start. But that start has to be authentic. And in the business, not just... In the business. Charity, that yeah. sort of, right. Because yeah. that's, that, as you point out, that sort of, that was then. This that is was now. then. Honestly, yeah. that doesn't cut it. Right. And it is amazing the number of businesses one still meets. You come in and they say, oh, but we're very, we're very good. Haven't you seen what we do in our foundation? That is not the question any longer. The question is, what are you to these big societal questions? What is your business to these big societal questions? The fact that you give away, even if it's quite large sums of money by ordinary people's standards, and some good works happen with it. Marvellous. The world needs lots of good works. But that's not the question being asked of business today. It's how are you earning your profits? It's not what are you doing instead of your profits or with your... It's how are you earning your profits. That's really what the world is asking today. That's what social value along with financial value means. And if you look at it very fiercely, what you're actually seeing is this is all about externalities. Mm -hmm. This is the, these businesses, businesses today, if you look at the last 20 years, you look at most big businesses today, even if they're just in the supply chain of big businesses. These are huge entities and their very success is throwing off massive externalities whether that is carbon emissions or whether it is employing tens of thousands of people below the living wage, below the, here's the clue, living wage. So your business model apparently can't play to the living wage. You're putting things into the market, throwing off these carbon emissions. Society is saying, why is that a successful business? Why is that ultimately okay with the rest of the world? So underlying this, is a question about the externalities of big business. And that's why it's how do you make your profits. So it's, it's really, um, if we think in the, in the long-term mindset, it is internalizing some of those externalities yes. before someone does it for you. Yes. Uh, and so therefore you can do it more creatively on your own terms yes. and so on. And it's extraordinary that when you do do that, you, you, you are unleashing a kind of innovation inside the business you know there's a very good reason that the people who do it start to find it is actually a reframing of how you ask questions and you're starting to go oh, you could come at this question a whole other way around and a lot of business leaders like being that kind of business leader you know let me just look at this problem another way around couldn't we ask ourselves whether we could come up with an innovative response here so it, it, it's a real question. It's outside the historic parameter. But it is a business question and it appeals to a successful business mind. Um, so, but, but I think businesses are being asked to internalize externalities. And I think it's why the question of purpose is a complicated and problematic question. Because you see a lot of businesses interpret this question solely as if it was a question about purpose. So let's caricature it for a minute. You make drugs, so very important medicines for the world. And that business will say, but we make wonderful medicines for the world. And you'll literally sit with the management team that goes, well, what more do they want? I mean, we make these marvelous medicines. The world needs them. That's your purpose. Yes, but you're making them at this cost to the world, most people who could access this medicine can't afford it. So the costs in the health systems, where, where do you sit on that question? Or, but we're producing, we, we package this food and it's so important to have safe food all over the world. And now we have a lot of packaging waste. Ah, oh, but that's not our problem, that's the government's problem. 
Yes, but you're reporting profits every quarter about how successful you are. And as much as you're churning out marvellously packaged food, you're churning out waste. The world is saying we, we literally can't afford that any longer. So what are you going to think about how you work across your ecosystem to solve that problem? So an important part of this, so it's sort of it's sort of fully loading your costs, if you will. Yes. That's kind of the way of thinking. That's the way I think about it as an yes. investor. And is if you think as an investor, and investors are important constituents in this um, conversation because um, some investors are really uh, wanting people to solve these problems. And then some investors, you hear them say, why are you being distracted by yes. this purpose conversation or whatever yes. this yes. thing is? How do you think about the, the both as a CEO dealing with an investor. What do you say to the investor when the investor says, why are you spending your time on this? I, mean, I, I assume you explain it's part of your strategy, but, but sometimes they get that and sometimes they don't. And then how do you talk to the investors about picking the companies that are actually doing this when you know they can trade their portfolio? They're, they're diversified and they, yes. and they're, they come and go. Yes. Um, unlike, a, unlike a CEO who only has one job. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, you know, that is absolutely the hardcore question, isn't it? And as we well know, and as you know better than most, um, a lot of the investment community, put as its largest, is, um, is not on that storyline and is looking for return and immediate return and so forth. It is interesting to see quite the sort of almost pell-mell rush towards... ESG in its various forms. Now, I'd be the first to say there's a huge muddle going on in ESG. But one of the reasons that people are falling pell-mell towards it is they can sense that whether it's actually ultimately people with wealth in their pockets or the regulator is asking for this in the long run. So there's all sorts of muddles of, you know, greenwashing in the financial institutions because everybody's trying to hurry up and get there and they're making a bit of a muddle of it. But the long-term undertow is pretty clear. I mean, regulators all over the world are coming together on these big questions. And it was only carbon, and now it's not carbon, it's carbon and plastic, and it was just carbon and plastic, and now it's carbon and plastic and biodiversity. The world's nations are going here. You can feel nations being overturned by the inequality issues, which in some way gives you access and wages and labor relations and so on. This is happening. So even if you only take it as risk mitigation, it's a pretty strange management team that's not thinking about those things. So you would expect most investors to go, how are you thinking about those things? And once they've started to think those questions and ask those questions, you can actually see increasing numbers of them going, so you're just treating it as mist risk mitigation? When there's an enormous opportunity, you know, as we've heard from Vic, you know, the, the, the Unicorns of the next generation are not going to be tech uniform unicorns, they're going to be environmental unicorns. So this is, it is, the long term is going this way. So in the immediate term, people might recoil, but the imperative is there. What I think is very interesting is coming back to your very first question, what is the activist mindset? The people who succeed in this new model are the people that have conviction and understanding in themselves. This needs to happen. Exactly as you said, not because the regulator told me, not even because the employees are on my back, not even because my kids at the kitchen table are saying, hey, where are you at on these questions? It's got to happen. You know, most business leaders can see the world and they're pretty good at interpreting the world. So they're starting to go, this has got to happen and I'm part of it. And you're right, the ones who win are saying to their shareholder base, this is the long-term storyline, isn't it? And as long as they carry that conviction, it is extraordinary how they carry their shareholders. And of course, one of the strongest examples of that has been MasterCard, which had most innovative response um, that you, know, you can put your finger on very quickly. So at the point when Banger took over as CEO, He's looking at, well, what shall I, what do I do to progress this business? And as he puts it, well, I could fight for a little bit of the share of who's got these plastic cards in their back pocket. 
Or you could say there's a whole lot of people who don't have anything in the financial services arena. That's a very big space to go after. Let's go after that. And so he was saying to his shareholders from day one, it may take a while, it may even outlast my time as CEO, but we're going to be a completely different company if we answer that bigger question, stay with us. And so they did. It took them 10 years. But they were a very good example of starting with one big move, really, and a commitment to keep innovating. And of course, what an activist does is they don't pilot. And if the pilot doesn't work, they bin the idea. They have a go at something. You can call it a pilot, if you like. And then they go, well, that didn't work. But we've still got to get there. So what's our next idea about getting there? And you start to use your lessons along the way to fuel your journey. So... That's a very good example of somebody as CEO going, the long-term opportunity is, is here. And they said, we don't know how the business model will evolve, but it's going to have to. And so it is a long-term, thoughtful business leader who looks, like, looks at these questions like that. On the other hand, isn't that what we need? And I think that there is a generational shift 10 years ago the business leaders who were doing this were sort of exceptionalist. I'm doing this. Well, and Pullman was famously leading the charge, but there were many others. And they were kind of going, we're going to show you this is done, can be done. It's a bit like when John and I first wrote, we were going, it must be doable, isn't it? Let's see if it's out there, you know. Where now you're looking at the likes of RJ Banger, he's moved on, or you're looking at um, Novo Nordisk, or you're looking at Coca-Cola, or you're looking at J.P. Morgan, or you're looking at Nestle. These are organizations saying we're putting it in the way we run the business. My job as a CEO or the leadership team around me is to go, how do we make this commercially viable? This isn't exceptionalist. This is looking at the way you run a business in this way. And that's very new. That's the last handful of years. But you listen to Mark Schneider or any of these business leaders say, but I've got to go to the shareholders and ask for money to sort the biodiversity question and the long-term regeneration question in my business, or 10 years from now, we have a real problem. So it's a long-term mindset. And there, and then, of course, their, their next generation of leaders are then being brought up with that mindset rather than having to make a switch. Yes. So um, the last question I'll ask you is to look forward... Look in your crystal ball a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, we clearly have a lot of disruption going on, whether it's in geopolitics, artificial intelligence, changing demographics, many, many other areas. Um, what issues do you think boards and leaders should be considering now that maybe are not, you've mentioned some of them, but that are, but that are, but what are the issues that you you know, if you come back in, you know, five years, you think we'll be center stage, even if they're right now um, just rearing their heads a little bit. I think you mentioned one. I, th I think AI is one. Um, it, of course, AI is the shorthand for such a huge arena. But I think that whole question of what technology is about to unleash on us and the management of data that goes hand in hand with us of course, people are on it now, but nothing like they're going to need to be. And every business is going to need to be. I think another way of looking at the same question might be to say, how are people seeing these, issue, these same issues evolve? So what you sometimes hear is, you know, well, it isn't all about carbon emissions, you know. No, no it isn't, you're right. In fact, is it that it's really carbon emissions and then biodiversity or regenerative agriculture, however you want to talk about it, and actually that's a huge influencer on carbon. And then you're no sooner across the biodiversity question than you're also going, so where are we on water? So actually you're seeing the world turn, as it were, and start to get more sophisticated about how these issues join up. And if you've got an activist mindset, you see that in your business. If you're trying to solve or solve for the climate question, you will be, if you're an agricultural-based business, looking at biodiversity. If you're doing that, you will be looking at water. So I think it's less about 
separate issues and more about how they connect. I am fascinated by the degree to which most business leaders will read, as it were, in The Economist more or less every week, you know, big structural challenges around inequality. But they don't actually bring it back to their own business that DEI is the sort of bit that they have massive control over inside their own organisation, which is an inequality issue. They don't see it as a labour issue and a, and a wage question. They don't see it as, so the share buybacks are instead of what in terms of innovation in the business? So it's an area where most business leaders don't join the dots in the same way they do in environment and say oh, a lot, almost every business we deal with in the inequality space has an access question. Access to medicine, access to broadband, access to skills. That's just another face of the inequality question. So I think this story of the evol the, these big monster issues are evolving. And how do you keep moving with that question to be on the front line of how that question is being asked next, rather than it being a different question? Does that make sense? So if you if we think about the sort of long arc of time, it's what benefits have you gotten or not paid for, such as the externalities, and then what are kind of the um, competitive pinch points that are you see right now, maybe it's a, enough labor force, whatever it might yes. be, um, and then how what, what is actually underlying that, and rather than just you know, rather than just that. Uh, and lean into it. And lean into it. Lean to it. Because the interesting thing when you say that is not just where have you been getting it for free, as it were, externalities, but where is the way these issues are unfolding in the world actually going to impact your business? And one of the most important things that you can really free yourself from if you look at it in this activist mindset is nobody's saying necessarily it's your fault. Fault. It's right. not the you know, big ag has solved a lot of problems of, of food security around the world, but it's unleashed the next problem. Big ag is stripping down soil quality and biodiversity. We can't afford that. So you're always asking yourself the next strategic question. And when you look at it like that, it's much easier to take it into the core of your business and assume you need to act and to challenge yourself as a business leader. Can you look? full-heartedly at these questions and go, what am I to that question? What is our business to that issue? And can I help? Well, I think that's a great place to, to leave this, which is to say, you know, if leaders think about um, what are these issues to them and what are they to the issues, then they don't feel like they're just being pelted with, you know, one issue after another. It's exactly. really what makes their business competitive? What is the next strategic problem? How do they put that into the core? Um, so that they can, you know, that's where business problem solvers think. As you say. Exactly, which yes, is why it's quite say. exciting, actually. Yes. It's not just a challenge and a problem. It's no. actually a way of being a leader right. into the future. Right. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. I Great really appreciate it. pleasure to talk to you. And, and The Activist Leader is, ha, is published in the UK and will be published in the US in September. Is that right? It's available uh, as an ebook now, but as the an hard ebook, copy but the will hard be available, copy will in, September. Be available in, September. in September. All right. Thank you so much, Lucy. Great pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.